It was in 1924 in the city of Caldwell, Idaho. Sister Maddie Crawford began a Pentecostal tent revival. You can be seated in a predominantly Baptist town that lasted for several weeks. Louise Fretwell, just a teenage Sunday school teacher at the Rosewell Baptist Church, was one of the first of many that received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in that tent meeting. Kenneth French was 16 years old and he was the son of the Sunday school superintendent of the Rosewell Baptist Church and he was baptized in Jesus name in that same tent meeting. Kenneth and Louise French married, began to do a work for God and were pleased just being there in Caldwell. However, a few months after Brother French received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, God began to stir his spirit about becoming a foreign missionary to a distant land. It was disturbing to Brother French, and he began to wrestle with God over this. After several weeks of wrestling one night in prayer over the call of God, Brother French finally prayed this prayer, Lord, I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything you want me to do. As Soon as he said those words, immediately a large map of Alaska appeared to him and God knew, or he knew that God was calling him to Alaska. Sister French had always felt that she would be a missionary. She thought possibly she'd be a missionary to Tibet. One night in prayer, God gave her a vision, a cluster of little homes built on stilts and the sun coming up from the north. She asked God if this vision was Tibet. And another vision came to her. And that same sun turned in to the northern lights and she knew without any doubt that God was calling her to Alaska. But not only Alaska, but very specifically Sitka, Alaska. Brother and sister French sold their belongings, what little they had. They packed up their two little girls and they drove their 1928 Chevy with a homemade trailer to Seattle. They sold their car for $10, sold the trailer for four, bought tickets on a freighter that was taking cows up north. The SS Tungus pulled into the harbor of Sitka in May of 1940. And there standing on the beach were a cluster of little houses on stilts, exactly like the vision God had given Sister French that night in prayer. It was tears streaming down their cheeks Hand in hand, they walked off that freighter onto the docks of Sitka, Alaska, saying these words, we will take Sitka for Jesus. They had no support. They had no partners in missions. The only thing that they arrived in town with was nine bucks and a burden. I preached to this crowd tonight something that's in my spirit. Nine bucks and a burden. I wonder if you could grab the hand of the one beside you. I don't have a sermon tonight. But I do have a message. 
And I want God to open my spirit to deliver into your spirit. Can we pray together? One voice, one accord. Come on, raise your voice just for a moment. Matthew 9, 35, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, something happened. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted, they were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plenteous, but I don't have any labors. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into the harvest. The NIV reads verse number 36 this way. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When Jesus saw the multitudes, the Bible says he was moved with compassion. Why? Because they fainted and they were scattered abroad. Another version says because they were harassed and they were helpless. The original writing of this text, it literally means this, that the people were weak, they were exhausted, they were give out, they were dejected. There's also an implication in the original language that there was a loss of hope. Why? Because they didn't have a shepherd. It wasn't the disease in the crowd. It wasn't the sickness. It wasn't the religious tradition that held them captive. The exhaustion and the dejection and the hopelessness of that multitude that day was simply because they were sheep and they had no shepherd. I've always assumed that this passage is talking about the mass, the multitude is what moved the heart of Jesus. I've always read it that when Jesus saw the size of the crowd, there was something that moved him. But Jesus was not moved because of the size. Jesus was not moved because even the need. Jesus was moved and he was overcome because they had no shepherd. I'm here to tell this crowd today, the body of Christ, the thing that moves our Lord and our Savior is sheep without a shepherd. I stand in this pulpit and proclaim to you the thing that moves the very heart of the one we worship is sheep without a shepherd. You don't find many times in Scripture God becoming emotional. You don't find a lot of times Jesus becomes overwhelmed. But there are a couple of passages. One is in Matthew 23. And I was amazed when I began to look into this. It's a very long chapter of letters in red. Jesus speaking with righteous indignation and 39 verses Jesus speaks a very emotional field 
passage. And it concludes this way. And you can feel the emotion and you can feel the anger and you can feel the indignation in Jesus' voice when he said, I sent you prophets or shepherds, if you will, and you killed them. Another is in Luke 19, Jesus is riding down into the city of Jerusalem and he descends into the valley of Kidron and he's on the road of the Mount of Olives and as he comes down that road, he gets a panoramic view of the city of Jerusalem and the Bible says he begins to weep and in the original it really actually means that there was intense sobbing. And so when you look at what moves Jesus, it's got to be something that moves us. When you look at move, what moves our God, it's got to be something that must move the people of God in these last days. If it moves God, it ought to move me. I want to be moved by what moves God. I want to be moved by what makes Jesus emotional. And here's what it is. Sheep without a shepherd and cities without a prophet. Sheep without a shepherd and cities without a prophet. I wonder sometimes if I'm moved, if we are moved by the wrong things. I wonder sometimes if I, as a pastor, as a minister, celebrate the wrong things. I wonder if the things that move me are the things that move Jesus. Luke 10, Jesus sends them out two by two. It's one of my favorite chapters of Harvest. He sends them out and then he tells them to go and harvest. They come back 16 verses later saying nothing about the harvest. They come back 16 verses later and they're celebrating and they're shouting and they're rejoicing and they're dancing and they're having a good apostolic Pentecostal service. But they're rejoicing over having authority over the devil. We do have authority over the devil. We do have authority over the gates of hell. Everybody in this room with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the name of Jesus has a key to those gates. But Jesus got a little bit upset with him and he said, I told you that you ought to go into the harvest and I paraphrase now. He said, you ought not to be rejoicing because I saw the devil fall. He said, but if you're going to rejoice, why don't you rejoice because your names are written down in heaven. I've come to tell this conference tonight, I want to be moved by what moves Jesus. We have got to be moved by the things that move our Lord. Nobody needs to stand in this pulpit and tell about the dire situation of our world. Nobody needs to stand here and talk about the hopelessness of our nation. It's well documented. The moral erosion of our society is not a news flash. The spiritual destitute is nothing new. The complexity of the last 18 months has overwhelmed everybody in this room. Not one person has escaped it. But what I am compelled to stand in this pulpit and tell you tonight is this. It's very simple. How can they, those people I just talked about here, without a preacher? They cannot. How can they be led without a shepherd? They cannot. How can they be healed without a local church, Brother Brown? They cannot. They simply cannot. And the only hope for any town 
I said the only hope for any town in this nation or for a matter of fact in any town in this world, the only hope is that, that there is a shepherd, that there is the presence, that there is an existence of a shepherd that preaches the good news. There is no hope without a shepherd. But if there is a shepherd, I could preach a little while on this. If there is a shepherd, everything changes when a shepherd comes to town. I'm really not preaching that message tonight, but I'll tell you something God showed me just in the last few days, right after the birth of Jesus. Have you ever wondered why it was the shepherds that got the exclusive? There is something about a shepherd. There is something about the existence of an apostolic voice that walks into a city. I don't care what's going on in the last 18 months when a shepherd shows up, the atmosphere shifts and everything changes. If a shepherd shows up, it's not over. Somebody hear what I said tonight. When a shepherd shows up, Jesus packs up and he says everything is going to be all right here. If there's a shepherd hungry, folks, get fed. If there's a shepherd, the thirsty can find drink. The brokenhearted can be restored when the river begins to run through. Where are you, John? Stand up, John. Where's John Martin? When the river begins to run through that city, everything changes. I said everything changes when the river runs through the city. Thank God for men like John Martin who will leave and pay. They pastor a good church in Muncie, but say there's another city right on down the road that they don't have a shepherd. It's not over. The only hope for any town. The only hope for any town. I said the only hope for any town, any village, any community is the fact that there's a church. The church is the only entity on the planet that changes the atmosphere. I've come to remind somebody in this building tonight that the thief is still in the stealing business. Hell is still in the killing business. I want to remind us at this first gathering since COVID broke loose that hell is still in the killing business and the devil is still destroying. Hell is still real and people are still lost and the local church is still the only answer that this world has. Globally, 65 million people die every year. 178,000 every day, 7,000 every hour, 120 every minute. In the United States, 2.6 million die every year, 7,000 every day, 297 every hour, and five minutes, or five every minute, sheep are lost without a shepherd. Sheep are going to hell without a shepherd. A community without a church is a lost cause. I'm a faith preacher, but I'm here to tell somebody that a community 
without the presence of a local church is a lost cause, write it off. But everything changes when somebody comes to a conference. Let me tell you what I feel is going to happen in the Holy Ghost tonight. I feel like God is going to put into the burden of some pastor in this building or some minister in this building. You're not going to go out from underneath the authority or the submission of your pastor. But here's what I feel is going to take place. That there are going to be pastors and there are going to be ministers that are going to catch something in the Holy Ghost tonight. And when we walk out of here... Bishop Bernard, I feel like there are going to be sheep that will find shepherds and there will be cities that will now have churches. I must needs go through. I must needs, Brother Gleason, go through Samaria. Why, Lord, do you want to go through Samaria? There's a better route. If we go east, we can cross the Jordan, and then we can go north, and we can then slip up into Galilee that way, and it's a much better route. Samaria is dirty. Uh, Samaria is unrighteous. I'm sorry. Samaria is interracial. And there is a better way to Galilee. But there's, there's a lady there. Thank you, gentlemen, for your GPS navigation. But you don't understand there's somebody that's thirsty. There's a woman, I know she's immoral. I know her life's a mess. I know she's had five husbands and then she's with another one but she's thirsty and there's nobody there because y'all are too good to go there but I must I must go I'm wondering if there's somebody in this audience tonight that's hearing the call of a thirsty person in the next town I know it may be off the beaten path and I know you may have to go through skid row to get there and I know that your car may get messed up while you're parking there at that house teaching a Bible study but there's thirsty sheep and thirsty sheep they need a shepherd Thirsty sheep need a shepherd. Can I get just a little personal right now? I love this organization. I've been a part of it all my life. It's all I've ever known. I love my heritage. My mom and dad aren't able to be here tonight. It's a long journey, but I don't know of two People that are more Christ-like than my mother and my father, and I'm so appreciative of that. In case you're wondering, I love this apostolic message from the top of my head to the bottom of my soul, and there is nothing that I would ever give in exchange for this Jesus' name, one God, holiness, apostolic message. And it is 
is truly an honor to be among a fellowship of godly men and women such as the ones that sit in this room. My mentors sit in this room. Holy men of God that have poured their life into mine sit in this room. My dearest and my closest friends on the planet sit in this room and I'm in debt to the men and women of this fellowship who have shaped my life. The fact of the matter is this. I'm actually a byproduct of a man and a woman that sold everything they had. They went to Sitka, Alaska with nine bucks and a burden. I will live my life thanking the men and women in this room. But the fact of the matter is, I'm a byproduct of Kenneth and Louise French that wrestled with God all night, but at the end of the night, they said, okay. And when Kenneth and Louise French went to their Samaria, they went to their well. Here's what they did not know. Back in 1940, 1950, the villages and the towns of Alaska, they didn't have high schools, they had elementary schools, and so they would send the kids of those villages to uh, uh, an island off of the mainland of Sitka just across the harbor called Mount Edgecombe, and it, it was a boarding school, and, and so they would send high school students from around the state to Mount Edgecombe. And among those was an 18-year-old girl, thirsty. She was a Russian Orthodox girl. Put that picture on the screen. She'd been raised in a little village called Uzinki, Alaska. Spruce Island just sits a few short distance off of Kodiak Island. They didn't have a high school there, so she was at Mount Edgecombe. She knew that there had to be more to this thing called God than what she had heard in the Russian Orthodox Church in the village. And so she began her search for God. And among her and her friends, they visited every little church in Sitka, Alaska, but there was a particular Sunday morning that they happened to walk into a little Pentecostal mission on Front Street in Sitka, Alaska. And that little Russian Orthodox girl received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and was baptized in Jesus' name. And Betty Smith ended up a nurse in Anchorage at the Native Hospital and there she ran into a soldier boy who was up there in the army trying to just put in his time and be gone. His name was J.R. Blackshear. Betty is my mom. J.R. Blackshear is my dad. Nine bucks and a burden is where I came from. That's where I came from. I got a lot of people in this room to thank for a lot of things, but at the end of the day, when you shake it all out, nine bucks and a burden is where I come from. That's my very spiritual existence because a laborer went into a field of harvest with no PIMs and nothing but a burden because there were sheep that were thirsty.
I stand in this pulpit tonight and I preach to this congregation. My kids are here. Brother Sister I mentioned it. I've preached around this world. I've been so blessed. I've been so honored. It's nine bucks and a burden. That's my existence. That's my DNA. Kenneth and Louise French started churches all over my district that I was born in. They started churches everywhere they could. I've read letters of their appeal. They weren't even, they, they weren't even a, a, a district. It was not even a, a they, they were not even foreign missions back then. They would write letters just asking for some help. They didn't receive all the help they wanted. They figured it out. And they would get a little work started, Brother Sistrunk, and they would go on down the road and they would open up another work. He could not stop. He couldn't help himself. On his deathbed, he told his sweet wife, Louise French, he told her this. He said, God is going to raise me up and we're going to go to one more place and I'm going to open another work. God's going to heal me and we're going to go start another church. He died a week later, but I'm here to tell you with nine bucks and a burden, he turned me upside down. He turned our district upside down. And I think tonight he's going to turn this fellowship upside down because I feel the burden of a Kenneth French. Nine bucks and a burden. God's going to raise me up. We're going to go start another church. Mark 1. I'm going to close. Mark 1, 38. It's the theme of this service. Let us go until the next town. That we may preach there also. Those of you watching online, there should be a link. Here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to consider going one town down the road and just giving God a chance. What happens if you just go? Start a Bible study in the next town. There's 20,362 towns in North America. Bishop, there's 4,147 churches. Let me put a number on the screen. That leaves us 16,215 towns and villages and communities. I don't have a shepherd. They're on their way to hell. And the reality is we're the only ones that can change that. They're sheep without a shepherd. 16,215. Who's going to go? Who's going to go next door? Who's going to go to Samaria? Jesus said, don't pray for the harvest. And I know we do a lot of preaching about revival, but that's not even biblical. We ought to do a lot of preaching about laborers. The harvest is already there. The problem is not the harvest, my dear brothers and sisters. The problem is the labor force. I stand here tonight in this pulpit, a man under conviction. I'm going to be, I'm going to be transparent with you. I'm a man under conviction tonight. Please, please understand my spirit. Brother Sistrunk mentioned it. 
I have been honored to serve in a church in Anchorage, Alaska that believes in giving. They have been givers. I'm an honored man to serve in that church. They have given in the last two years, the th- maybe three years, the largest Christmas for Christ offering. Please understand my spirit. The district that I'm a part of, and thank you, Alaska, Yukon, for being here. They're a giving district. The average church in the United Pentecostal Church, please hear me out, gave an average of $1,441 to Christmas for Christ. We thank you for every dollar. The average church in Alaska is a small church. The average church in Alaska gave $17,372. But listen, listen. I've spent some time alone with God this summer. He's been telling me some things I didn't want to hear. He's been telling me some things probably for a long time, but I didn't want to hear them. Begin to say it. A little bit louder this summer. Things like this. You can't buy your way out of a burden. Thank you, Life Church, for giving. Thank you, Alaska. But the Holy Ghost has convicted me. He said, You can't buy your way out of a burden. I know you can give, but can you go? So I come to the conclusion after spending some time alone with the Lord that it's easier to give than it is to go. And so I've been sharing this with our church. I'm committed I say this publicly I'm committed to plant 10 churches in the city that God called me to pastor I know we can give it but I cannot buy my way out of a burden and half of my district lives in my city and their sheep without a shepherd so I've been sharing this I was on a plane last Saturday and when I landed I got this text from a lady in our church that was one off the streets her name is Stacy she's a licensed minister and she runs our bus ministry so I've been preaching about this and I've been talking about this and at 2.37 a.m. on Saturday morning when I landed, this text came through. She said, I filled up my living room last night. I didn't ask her to go. Consequently, she's the biggest giver we have to Christmas for Christ in our church. She sent me a text. I filled up our living room last night. She said there were 27 people. She said there was more people than we can handle. And I made my husband and my children go outside. There were 27 thirsty people. Thank you, Jack Yance, for telling us to give our best gift to Christ but what about giving our best preachers what about our best singers 
What about our best Sunday school teachers? We've written some big checks, but I haven't released our best preachers. Oh God, if Kenneth French can say on his deathbed, God's going to raise me up because I'm going to plant another church in this district. God help me. God help me. God help me go across town. God help me go to the next town. God help me find a sheep that's thirsty. Stand, we've mistaken money for mission. Buildings for burden. Giving for going. I'm old enough to remember conferences where they had to come and tap us on the shoulder and say, you got to go. I remember going to conferences where we sobbed on altars after men of God preached about steps to hell and souls that are lost where I'm asking myself are the days where are the days that I walked out of a conference service turned upside down and I made commitments to God right here in these pulpits or right here in these altars that I'm going to go find some sheep at a well when a burden was more essential than a bed, when a soul meant more than a sermon, when a calling, please understand my spirit, meant more than a career, when eternity outweighed an education. I'm for an education. Get all you can and get over it and get to Samaria because there's a thirsty lady there and she's just looking for somebody to draw some water. I preach a global mission service tonight, Brother Hal. Thank you for your prayers. Church plants are the maternity wards for global missionaries. I have a question. What if, what if Brother Ralston never went to Plaster Rock? What if a little boy named Benny church plant a little boy named Benny goes to Brazil. Hundreds of thousands of church plants. Every evangelist in this room, every global missionary in this room, every district superintendent, every leader, every pastor, every teacher, every prophet, every single one of them came from a church plant. 600, 16,215. Who's going to go? Let me tell you what needs to happen right now. That number needs to start going down. There's somebody that needs to get online under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and fill out a pledge card and say, I don't know exactly how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to go across town or I'm going to go to the next town and I'm going to find a well and I'm going to find somebody that needs a shepherd and I'm going to teach a Bible study. Who knows what's going to happen? Our NAM directors have already turned in some commitments. I've already turned in some commitments. And I'm asking some pastors tonight to listen to the voice of the Holy Ghost. I know there's great restaurants in this city, but sheep are thirsty and they need a shepherd. 
These altars are open. I'm finished. You have a pledge card, man of God. Nam is going to partner with you. Nam is going to help you. Nam is going to do whatever we can to help you go to your city. But somebody first has got to make a commitment to go. My house ah. is full, but my field is empty. Sheep without a shepherd you will go and work Sheep. for me today. Without a shepherd, it seems my children all want to sit around my table, but no one wants to work. My feet. I'm asking a pastor to listen to the voice of God right now. No one. I'm asking a man of God to release a couple to go across town and start a preaching point. Start a daughter work. I'm looking for some laborers. Come on, pastors. Come on, pastors. Speak to you. No one wants to work Where's the next Billy Cole gonna come from? Where's the next Benny DeMerchant gonna come from? Where's the next Gerald Mangan gonna come from? Where's the next Nona Freeman gonna come from?
at your chair there's a card that says the next town the next town we're asking for pastors ministers if God is moving on your heart we want you to act in this moment we want you to make a commitment this is a pledge this is a declaration from your heart that you want to plant another church and we're asking you to fill this out and all across this room we have North American missions team members located with buckets so we just want you to drop that card in the bucket we want to get back to you we want to talk to you of course you need approval from your district but we just want to talk about and celebrate scope and scale what God has done in this place does anybody feel that there's a spirit in this house that's going to change the world does anybody have a feeling that churches are going to be planted in Jesus name young ministers pastors find that card right now find that card right now fill it out the spirit of the Lord is moving don't let this window pass you by there are blessings and there there are answers that are coming through your action answered prayer churches are going to be planted through this moment right here in Jesus name fill this card out find one of our team members with a bucket let's celebrate together what God is doing
America. There's, we're going to plant churches from coast to coast. Every city, every town, and every village. Come on. Nine bucks and a bird. What are your excuses? I hope God is taking your excuses away tonight. Come on. Just say I'll go. Just say I'll For just a minute I want you to put some action with this it's so important that you write down a name of a city now this is like making a pledge to give and by the way if you feel to give you can still give but nobody's going to call you a liar because you filled out a card and wasn't able to do it in the next 12 months this is saying if God will help this is a faith pledge. I'm going to plant a church. I want you to fill out a card tonight because we're going to follow up with you and we're going to send you training information. We're going to send you help. We're going to tell you how you can connect with your district, how you can connect with North American missions. We're going to tell you the kind of programs that are available to help you plant this church. So if God's talking to you, if God's spoken a city to your heart, make sure you fill out that card. We're believing God tonight for 600 commitments. That's what I ask God. We need 600 commitments. We started off the service with 177. But I believe, I, we, we can't count them all right now, but I believe that God has spoken to that many people to plant a church. Please make sure you fill out the card because you know what? We're serious about this. I said we're serious about this. I believe that there's an army that's going to rise up and take the gospel to every town, every city, and every village. Politicians don't declare war. The Congress will not, uh, doesn't wait until they have the army ready to declare war. When there's a threat, when there's a need, when America is attacked, war is declared. And then the young people, the young men and women rise up to the challenge. And we are declaring tonight that we're going to plant a church in every one of these cities. It's not impossible. God's going to help us do it. And he's going to raise up an army. Fill out a card tonight. Give us your name. Give us this perspective town. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's pray. Let's continue to pray. If you can. Let God continue to talk to you tonight. God bless you. 